you're going to hear from two great instructors that have offered their time. We have Margaret from the College of Nursing, Shauna from the College of Engineering. Both of these instructors have contributed ideas to the provost call on the creative classroom ideas that are being posted on Keep Teaching. So if you are not aware of that, if you go to the Keep Teaching website, down here on the bottom of the list is creativity in the classroom. And several of your peers from across the institution have submitted ideas of what they are doing this semester to help with student engagement in our blended synchronous classrooms. And so we just wanted to make you aware that even though it's not in a session, ideas are still being contributed and still being shared. So with that, I am Sam Shields. I'm an instructional consultant here at the Center for Teaching Excellence, and I'm joined by my colleague, Hannah Malcolm, who's going to help me monitor the chat. So if there's any questions you have along the way, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Just to give you an overview, if you didn't see them already in the email invitation, we have three main session outcomes for you today. One is to discover some student engagement strategies that your peers are using in this blended synchronous format. Two, to reflect on the effectiveness of those strategies that your peers are using so that hopefully number three, you can leave here with at least one boots on the ground idea that you could take and implement in your classrooms should you be interested in doing so. So for some of you, there'll be some learning for some of you, maybe not so much learning, but affirming of what you're already doing. And so the session will have three parts. We're gonna open with some sharing of examples. Then we'll do some breakout room share and more targeted discussion. And then we'll bring everybody back and debrief and open it with a question and answer session at the end. And so just some session logistics. Because of our size and that we only have an hour, We've defaulted to muting everyone's microphone but the presenter, but we don't want to inhibit questions. So if you do have questions, please feel free to drop those into chat, being mindful to keep our session outcomes in mind as that's what we're focused on here today. Then we will open it up to a verbal debrief and question and answer at the end. And then when we're all done, we'll be sure to share with you our Google Slides link so you have it as well as we're gonna create a Padlet of ideas today. So we'll make sure you have the Padlet link. And then since we are recording this, we'll make sure you have the YouTube session link should you want to, to review it in the future. So to get started, I'm gonna turn it over to Margaret, let her introduce herself, thank her again for being here, and then she'll share with you something she's doing that has worked for her in the classroom. So thank you, Margaret, for being here. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, yes, I am Margaret Bosenbark, and I teach in the College of Nursing. I'm a course lead for one of our courses in the Med Surge block. Um, the College of Nursing is very interesting in our sort of development of our response to COVID. Um, when we were part of the Health Science Center, we taught virtually in the classroom every day, every time that we would teach. We had students on a distant campus in Round Rock that would sort of teleconference in with us um, on video software. Um, so we were charged with teaching Brian students in person and at the same time teaching the cohort that was in a classroom in Round Rock. So some of that um, experience helped, I think has helped our college be able to respond to this particular call and need but using Zoom instead of the previous teleconference software. Um, so some of what I've implemented is teaching strategies that I used then. Um, so one thing that we do um, in lecture, of course, um, I have, right now I have um, 30 students um, in, my, in the cohort that's in my course. In the spring, I'll have 70, it kind of grows and shrinks. But, um, I make a, a schedule for the students and half the class can be in the lecture hall at a time based on the occupancy numbers that we're allowed to have. So I've already set out the whole semesters where the lectures of this, this group of students can be in the classroom this day. 
this group of students will be on Zoom. And then I've told the students, if you want to switch with a friend, you have something going on or whatever, and you want to give up your lecture in the lecture hall seat to somebody that's virtual, you can do that, but you cannot just come or go, right? Like this, you have to do a one for one switch. So that's one way that we've acknowledged that. But students are happy because at least right now, we're using Zoom in such a way that they don't feel like they're missing out. And what we're doing is when I have the students in the classroom, they all have to log in to Zoom, um, to the Zoom class. Um, so the students at home are logged into Zoom, the students in the classroom are also logged in to Zoom. Um, and then we just have them all mute um, their microphone. Um, and then the students in the classroom, of course, need to actually also mute their computer. Um, otherwise, there's an echo. So students in the classroom have to mute everything. Students at home just mute their microphone. Um, and then we get going with class. And, um, you know, I, I teach in a very um, dialogue type, here's the situation, what do you think about it way, because we're talking about being nurses. So um, we'll have what I have come to coin, I guess, the topic of think like a nurse, right? So I'll show out a problem, like this week was cardiac. So I would throw out, here's the problem with the heart for this particular illness. Now be a nurse, right? Think like a nurse, what are you gonna do about it? Um, and when we have those think like a nurse moments, the students are asked to go into breakout rooms. So I will use the breakout room feature in Zoom. I will just say basically equally divide up the students, right? So if I have 30 students, I'll make six breakout rooms, it'll divide it up and it does it um, automatically and it's random. So you may have some students in the classroom that are in the same group. Those students typically will sort of they all leave the classroom, quite honestly. We go out into the hall and elsewhere so that they can all be um, on Zoom together. They can turn on their mics, turn on their cameras and have a dialogue, um, but they stay, you know, distance and keep their masks on, all those things. Um, and then what happens is we have Zoom students mixed in with live students. Um, what I also love about that and the, the um, automatic nature of the sort of sorting of students is that um, in the past, I have witnessed people of color in my classroom get chosen last, so to speak, like last kid picked on the playground. Um, that was never acceptable to me, so I had to start assigning people to groups. Zoom does that for me. Like Zoom levels the playing field, not just for virtual and in person, but also for minorities or marginalized people groups or students that may not necessarily um, fit in with the larger student body. So. Um, Zoom really helps me in that way to make sure that everyone's assigned at the same time. Nobody is saying, hey, come be on my team. Um, and the students really are forced to work with one another, um, the students at home and the students in, in person. Um, then I can send out, during the time that they're working on the being a nurse, I can send out little prompts through the breakout room um, feature, right? So it'll say, you want to send an announcement to all breakout rooms? I could say, hey guys, uh, what if our patient had this happen, right? So then it would sort of send them out a change in scenario and they have to come up with something. And when they come back, they know, hey, I'm gonna call on group three to talk about this, or hey, group four, you better come up with this. And um, they can present. And so I have students from the, the house that are being the main presenter. I have students from the classroom being the main presenter. It's up to the student group who gets to do the talking. Um, so it's been really fun to watch them own that and really work together. Um, they've come up with some really amazing insight in a very short amount of time, um, which is really helpful <laughs> when you have a lot to cover. Um, the next thing that we do is, um, again, I have the chat feature turned on. I bring my laptop with me. So the podium um, computer is the one for the Zoom and sharing the slides and, and all of that. But my laptop is also logged into Zoom. Um, and that's strictly for the chat monitoring. And what I've done is I'll pull up the chat box and then I'll enlarge it. So it's like the size of my screen. So, so whenever somebody puts something in there, it's kind of big and I can, it kind of gets my attention while I'm talking. Um, so I can answer that question. Or I'll tell students, I've really got to get you through this concept and then I'm going to check questions in the chat. Um, and so um, I'll go, I call it Zoom land. I'm like, hey, Zoom land, right? What do you got for me of students in live lecture are not asking questions or not answering, I throw it to Zoom and say, hey guys, what you got? Nine out of 10 times, those students are actually more eager to get their voice heard and get, get recognized that they too are following along and they know the answer. So it's kind of fun to see them compete almost um, between those at home and those in the, in the classroom. 
um, when it comes to that dialogue style, hey, what do you got? Um, so that's what I, how I use the chat feature. Again, it's on my personal laptop, like at the podium with me. Um, my third favorite thing to do and what we've implemented since the spring, um, keep in mind College of Nursing has been teaching nonstop. We were still having students on campus in the summer. Um, we still taught, um, we taught all Zoom in the summer. We weren't allowed to be in the lecture hall, but we taught our labs in person and we took students to the hospital. So we've kind of had a different experience. But one thing that I noticed students were really missing was the professional mentorship piece um, to our program. I mean, these are professional students going into a, a profession that behaves a certain way that, that needs to be able to talk about certain concepts and issues um, in a certain way. And these students were missing that piece. They weren't being able to talk to me in the hall or um, just pop up to my office and ask me a question or see me at the coffee shop getting a cup of coffee. Um, so I said, well, why don't we start having sessions that are coffee talk sessions, right? And for anybody that's you know, older than our students, um, coffee talk, right? Back from the day, like you know, the coffee talk, right? So it was funny for me, they didn't get it, but it was a joke for me. Um, but we all just come, bring your coffee, bring your tea, bring your water, whatever it is. Like, let's just be humans, um, is my little Bosenbart catchphrase for my students. I'm like, let's be humans right now. Let's just talk about how we're feeling about life. And um, they would, I would have, a it started out, I had probably over 30 students every time, um, which is a big deal for us uh, coming to Coffee Talk. We would start out just by talking about normal stuff. How you doing? You know, is, are you okay? Are you safe? Where are you quarantining? How much Netflix have you watched? You know, that kind of stuff. And then it would usually unfold to their, their fears and their concerns. You know, how am I going to be a good nurse if I haven't been in the classroom? How am I going to know what to do with a patient? if I've never gone to the hospital or, you know, there, there are more professional concerns about how do I do this? How do I become like you, right? Um, so we were able to have those really in-depth conversations and mentoring moments. Um, some of them were just, um, I eventually got down to like three or four that really needed to see me. Um, I held them initially twice a week and then I went down to once a week. Um, but those students that came needed that encouragement and needed that um, mentorship to really continue and stay engaged um, with the course. So we still do those. We don't do them as often now because we are back together in the lab and in the hospital. Um, but we still have those moments of like, just be a human and tell me how you're doing. Um, and I think that that's benefited them. It's certainly benefited me in being able to reach them. Um, and we've been, like you said, juggling chainsaws and we're continuing to teach. So that's what I have to offer. Hey, Margaret, we have a couple of questions in the chat for you. Okay. Um, let me pull it up here then. Let's see. Oh gosh, I moved my bar so it's covering up my chat. Hold on. Hey, so, you, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I see. Um, do you limit student chatting amongst themselves and do you save your chat for review after class? Um, so are you talking about um, chatting amongst themselves um, during lecture, like in the chat box? Is that yeah, what you're like, pri like privately, um, mm. you know, because they're different. different. Oh. You can have them chat that all their chats are public in Zoom. Mm -hmm. And so the, the chatting privately is what I'm kind of concerned about. And then yeah. um, if you're using chat, are you actually saving it to review, you know, mm -hmm. um, for after class if you're using it to assign any grades or doing anything like that with it? Is my question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so far in the three, this is my third semester using Zoom to teach. And so far, um, I've not limited the private chatting. I know we have a, a much smaller cohort situation over here. I don't have 300 students attending class, but I can say that. Um, at least at this point, if someone's not willing to put a question publicly on the chat, but maybe they want to privately ask somebody else. I, I know this week I heard a student in lecture during a break time say to another one on the chat, like they had turned their cameras on or whatever, that he said to this other student, no, I feel really good about being here in the classroom. You know, it's a different experience, but it's, but he, he told this person, I'm still getting the same experience at home, like comparatively, he was kind of setting their mind at ease, right? That 
that, yeah, this still feels the same. We're still included the same. Um, but if there's students that need to talk to each other offline, I'm okay with that. They're going to do that anyway on their phone, most likely texting each other. Um, so I've not had any problems with that. The public chat, um, I try to answer all of it. And it's easier for me, again, because I have a smaller cohort. I'm able to address all of those concerns and questions right then. Um, now in the spring when I have 70 students, um, that might be more cumbersome and difficult to do in the moment. So at that point, yes, I would preserve that chat and then answer it usually back on um, eCampus or Canvas um, in an announcement after class. I say, here's the takeaway points from class today. Here were some of the questions that you guys had afterwards, um, sort of muddiest point kind of thing, um, and then clarify that in an announcement so everybody has access to that answer. So does that answer your question? Yes. Um, do you record your classes or you just... Uh, yes, it, it... yes, they're all recorded. Um, and during the group time, I pause the recording just so it doesn't have like this lag of nothing, you know, and then I'll turn it back on when we all come back live. Okay. Thank you. All mm -hmm. right, Margaret, thank you for sharing. If you have more questions for Margaret, I know there's one more for her in the chat, but to, I'm going to switch over to Shauna Thomas and let her introduce herself and Margaret can pick up and helping with answering any other questions you have specifically for her in chat. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce Shauna, but then I'm going to stop sharing my screen so she can share some stuff with you and then we'll hear what Shauna does in her class. So thank you for being here, Shauna. Sure, it's a pleasure. So I'm Shauna. I'm in the Department of Computer Science in the College of Engineering. Um, and like all of you, we're trying to figure out how to best facilitate things that we really want to do in our class in this new platform. The class that I'm teaching this semester is a project-based learning class that involves a lot of teamwork. Teamwork is one of the main learning outcomes. So that, that specifies that I need to teach the class synchronously and I need to find a way on Zoom to put groups together so they can collaborate. And so like Margaret, I'm using breakout rooms to do it. And I wanted to show you um, kind of what a class activity looks like. To give you context, before they come to class, they've watched some short lecture videos and answered some quizzes and polls and things like that. So most of the class time we're spending working in groups together. And um, so let me share with you, the way I do this is I uh, facilitate it with a worksheet. And I post this in the learning management system. We're using Canvas, but you could do this in eCampus too. And so I post, it's a Word document, and um, the first time, for a few times we do this, the students are figuring out how do they collaborate together, but now it's kind of a well-oiled machine. They know exactly what to expect. Like Margaret, I have uh, teams that are made up of both in-person and online students, so they're all mixed. Um, and in the beginning of the semester, like Margaret, I made them random. I let Zoom do that work for me, which was really great. But then once they get to know each other and they're going to start to work on a project, I need to have them working in on their project teams. So Zoom allows you to do this to preload. I have a class of about 90 students, so it's not feasible for me to click and drag them all into their breakout rooms. That would take our whole class time. <laughs> so Zoom allows you to upload a CSV file and there's some help documents you can go look for through that. The only like um, caveat with that one is that you need to use their TAMU email address, not email.tamu, that will not work, but at TAMU will work for them. So anyway, so I present them an activity and this is an example worksheet that they're going to get and fill out together. And they all have the same format. This activity, they were doing some team building skills. It was the beginning of their project and they're trying to get to know each other. So, um, and actually, we would have done this in face-to-face -face anyway. It's not just a uh, this semester deal. They normally would fill this out on paper, but it would be, it's electronic now. So everyone puts their name and UIN. This helps me make sure that if Canvas didn't assign the group assignment right, I know exactly who really did this. So it's nice to have that double check. Um, then I, at the next, I always have this table called roles. And I tell them, you know, sometimes we'll have an activity where every person has a different role, but I always have these three, a scribe, so whoever's responsible for filling this out, a reporter, so that's the one when we come back to discuss what happened, 
they're the one they know I've got to volunteer something. And then a moderator is helping make sure during the activity that everyone's getting a voice in their group. So these three people are also participating in the activity, but they have this kind of focus. And when we first did this, I explained what these roles meant. So they go fill that out. And so then I break it up into a series of steps. And so here they're doing some icebreakers and they're gonna fill out this worksheet. Then we're gonna come back for a discussion and I'll show you those slides here in a second. But then they build a, almost a collaborative agreement for this activity together, but that's their final product. Then what I have at the end is, is sometimes someone doesn't stay the whole time, which happens, it's less frequent in person because it's a little rude to just walk out of lecture, but sometimes they do this and, um, or someone might be sick that's on their project team and I need to know that they weren't here today. So they each put their name and together they fill out who, how much each person participated and they put their initials to say, yeah, I agree. And I told them most of the time it'll be equal weighting. It's not, I'm not like nitpicky. It's more of this person only did half the work or this person wasn't here today. That's the kind of things I'm looking for. And so then their activity grade will be impacted if something like that were to happen. Um, so then let me show you the slides that accompany this. So this is what the student sees, these document. And um, then when I facilitate it in class, I always start out the slide with like, here's, your, here's the big mission of what we're doing today. So here is we're gonna get to know each other and establish agreement with your team. And then I just give them the things they're supposed to do before I bring them back. So I'll say, I want you to assign the roles and fill this part of the worksheet out. Do not fill out the rest. And, and I also tell them, this is how much time you'll get. And so then what I'll do is when there's about three minutes up, I'll put an announcement in, the, in Zoom to all the rooms, hey, you have three minutes. And then um, at the two minute mark, I close the rooms and I have it set to take two minutes to do that. So they have a countdown timer. I found for them 60 seconds wasn't quite enough because they were wrapping things up and felt like surprised somehow. So I do that. Um, so then we come back and discuss. And so then I'll show them the next slide that will say something like, okay, now I want you to do this part and I, you need to submit it to Canvas. This is how much time you'll get. I try to make sure we have some discussion piece between each one, because there is some time it takes to bring them back and forth. Um, so I wanna make them understand that that's useful for us to come back. I also wanna not give them way too much time because they'll get way off track. <laughs> if I say, hey, you have half an hour, go, that's too long. Um, and then the last thing I would share is that while we're doing this, um, I have the advantage that my TAs attend on Zoom as well. And so I will send them around to different breakout rooms. And I tell the students, you know, you might have a TA popping in and they're not spying on you. They're there to help you with questions. And so most of the time the students don't have questions and they just kind of float around. And when they come back, I can say, hey, how's it going? Are they on track or are they need more time? It helps me get a gauge. And then I also tell them, remind them, they can always come to the main room and put something in the chat. Or I also have on our class drive, a shared document that just says question and answers and it's blank. And I'm watching that. Um, and so they can type the things in and I can respond the whole class sees it right away. If I think it's urgent, I'll put it in an announcement. I mean, in the, in, on all the rooms, but most of the time I just leave that there. Um, sometimes they use it, sometimes they don't, depends on kind of what they're having, struggling with or not. But that's, I try to give them lots of outlets to seek help because it's Zoom can feel like a black hole and I don't want them to feel that way. So there you go, that's all I got. Shauna, thank you for sharing that, that is great. So just to recap, did I hear you say you have three things? You have your slide deck that you use to facilitate, you have the student's Google Doc that they're completing in their group, but then you have a third Google Doc that's just questions and answers? Yes, it's blank. So in every class, I use the same one so they don't, like here's a new link. I just erase whatever was from the last session. And most of the time it's blank, but every once in a while someone will say, hey, you know, what are we supposed to, I don't understand this thing we're supposed to respond. And so then I can do that. Sometimes I'll travel to that breakout room or travel around, um, but with two TAs doing that, that's usually enough to get some coverage. Got it. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again.
So give me a second and I'll get that pulled up. And so what I wanted to do next was, so Margaret has shared how she, how she uses her Zoom breakout rooms. Shauna has shared how she uses them and facilitates them. I wanted to share with you a, a tool similar to the concept of Google in that how Shauna was sharing, she uses Google Docs and Google items to capture input from her teams. One of the things you can use in your classes is called Padlet. And it's something we're seeing more and more and we're hearing more and more. So we wanted to, to take a second here and share it with you. Just to give you an overview, Padlet is, is a cloud-based online bulletin board. So kicking it old school, going back to the 80s, think of a, a bulletin board that you would take things and, and post it on. And there are tons of ways that you could use Padlet, but the nice thing about it is it's collaborative. So like Google, multiple people can be working on a Padlet at the same time and posting to it and, it and it captures those things. And so I don't necessarily want to spend a ton of time going in how you can use it, but to show you what you can do with it. And so if you have your chat open, I'm going to drop into chat the link to a Padlet that I've created for us to, for lack of a better word, play with and for you to try it. And so let me drop this into chat, but my chat box seems to have disappeared when I started here sharing my screen. So give me just a minute to find my chat box real quick and get that dropped into there. So if you wanna click on that Padlet link while you're doing that, um, I'll quit sharing in case you need your screen. But what's going to happen is you're going to see this blue, what I've called our play padlet. And there is one post already pinned to our padlet. And what I've done is I've, so that you didn't have to be toggling between my PowerPoint and the padlet, I've actually taken the instructions for this and posted them to the padlet. And so what I want you to do is just try it. So what do you do with the Padlet? How do you get started? Well, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, there's a pink circle with a plus sign in it. And if you click on that, it's going to create your post. And you'll see there's a title up at the top and then an area where you can add text. And so just try it. See what happens to get out of your Padlet you click anywhere in the blue and that will close yours. If you wanna get back in, you just double click. I usually double click on the title and that gets me back in because what I've, what I've enabled on this one is you can see underneath everybody's post is a heart where you could quote like their post. And then I've actually enabled to where you could make comments. And so sometimes I hit the wrong place to get back with my double click to get back to my post. And so, oh, how fun. So we've even got a picture added. And so as you can see, when you create your Padlet, there's several things you can do. You can link to something, you can type text, you could drag something and upload an image. You could upload a file. So there's all kinds of things that you can do within your Padlet post um, as a way to capture your individual thoughts. And so the fun thing about this is if you can see what has happened when people have added theirs, my instruction, my initial one, stays at the very front and it's added all the new ones after that. And so that's one of the settings I'll show you here in just a minute so that the instructions stay first and foremost at the top and then everybody else's gets added along the way. And so um, just a way to capture some, some input, some content from your students in a collaborative type setting and then allow them to like and comment on others just a way to keep a dialogue going, to keep them engaged. Students who are in remote can do this. Students face-to-face -face can add to it. You don't have to worry about Zoom. Everybody can just have the link and post whether they're in class, they can come back to it outside of class, after class. 
And so I'm gonna take over the screen for just a minute to show you just some logistics about Padlet, because I know some people are like, this is really great, but how do you do it? And so with Padlet, when you first go to their screen or their website, it's very simple, padlet.com, you can sign up for free. I think there is a max to how many Padlet you can create with that free account, but I haven't reached it yet, and I, I've got at least three or four. Now, what you see on here is an intentional eight different colored boxes. And if you look underneath each one of those boxes, what you'll see is a title. So the pink is a wall format, the blue is a shelf, the green is a canvas. And what the difference between each of the Padlets is, is how folks' post will show up. And so you can create an account. Like I said, it's free. When you log in, you're going to see a very simple dashboard. So this is my dashboard. And if I want to create a new Padlet, I simply click on this pink, again, the pink plus, like we did on the actual Padlet. And then it's going to take me to those same eight colored items to choose from. But this time, it's going to give me a little bit of a description about the differentiation between each one of them. So what I had set up was a wall, and it's literally gonna pack content in like a brick-like layout. There's Canvas that lets you scatter, group, and connect. A stream is just gonna have them go straight down the middle, so on and so forth. They even have shelves where you can put stuff in columns, and the instructor could create column headings in advance. There's a back channel similar to what Shauna was talking about, how she uses her Google question and answer. You could use a Padlet for a back channel. There's a map and there's a timeline. And so where there's some variety, they're still all pretty simple. So you choose one and you just click that again, pink select, and then it's going to create one for you. But over here on the right is where I can begin to customize it. And this is all the settings I can choose from. So it's not overwhelming, but you do have some say. So you can title your Padlet. That's what's gonna show up here in the bolded larger font. You can put a description. That's what's gonna show up in this smaller font underneath. You can put an icon next to your title. It's gonna give you your Hey, what's your Padlet address? Well, here's what you share with folks. Then you get to the wallpaper. I have the hardest time choosing, but you can choose from all different kinds that are automatically in here um, based on how just fun and crazy you want your background to be. But, um, and then you can keep on going. You can choose a color scheme font. Um, down here, you have some posting options. It says attribution. So it will let you choose to display the author name above each post. So if you want your student's name to show up, if you wanted to use this to take attendance, you could turn that on and toggle that over. Um, this is where you can decide where new posts go. I had y'all set to last, so it added the new posts at the end so that my instructions stayed first and foremost. You can turn comments on or off. On my play one, I had the comments turned on, but you may not be interested in class. That may be a distractor. And so you can turn comments off. Um, reactions, that's where you can do the like and there's the heart. You can use it for voting, thumbs up, thumbs down. You can use it to rank and people can give stars one to five, or you can even give numeric scores with a grade. Just be careful of that a piece with that one. But then here's a piece that I, I really appreciate. Down here at the very bottom, there's a filter for profanity. So if you check that, it's going to replace bad words with nice emojis. <laughs> so I, I'm not, I haven't played with that to see how sensitive the profanity filter is, but it's there. And right above that is a require approval. So if I had toggled on require approval, I would have had to approve every one of your posts before it would show up on the Padlet. So if that's something you wanted, so if you wanted to grade them before they were posted, you could do that. Or if you wanted to approve them to make sure they're posting accurate information, you could do that. And so these bottom two are really helpful in, in thinking about what and how you want things to get posted. But then that's it. And so once I create it, I share the link with my students, give them a little explanation. I have to hit save up here at the top. And then next, and then that's it. Now your Padlet's 
ready to go. And so that it's as simple as that. It doesn't take but five minutes to get set up and ready and, and published, ready to go. Padlet doesn't have to approve it. It's already got the link there and is ready to go. So what we wanted to do next as a way to just keep generating ideas is to put you in breakout groups and do some similar work to what Shauna was talking about. Generate ideas, we're gonna have roles just to model what that feels like if that's not something you've ever done within your groups. But what I wanted to do so that you have access to all of this, similar to what Shauna was talking about, if you notice, I'm presenting from Google Slides and not PowerPoint. So I've chosen to dump my PowerPoint into Google Slides so that when I transition from my Google Slides or my PowerPoint presentation, I have all my tabs already open to do what Nate calls in our office tab surfing. And I'm not having to switch applications. So I don't have to have PowerPoint open on one screen and then my internet on the other screen. We've just found it to be a much more seamless approach to put our Google Slides into, or our PowerPoint into Google Slides if we know we're gonna be using other tabs during it makes for a whole lot easier and smoother transition. You can have those open. So if you're interested and you would like, here is the link to the Google Slides. I'll drop that. Hannah, do you mind dropping that into chat for me? My chat is lost again. Sure. <laughs> um, before we move on, there was a question about saving the information in Padlet. So Shauna offered that you could probably print to a PDF, but for folks who might want to um, save the information that's on their Padlet. Is there a way to do that? Yes. So let me show you back to my, let me find my dashboard. I may have to back out of this one. But what's going to happen is, sorry, let me back up one more time. So these are my saved Padlets or the Padlets that I've created. And if you go back into this, my very first one back here, this is a, a a blackboard type background that is the shelf approach to where it's columns and it's going to stay on here. I'd, I'd have to play a little bit more. I've never tried to actually quote save it and download it, but I know the content stays there until I delete it. And so I, I apologize. We, while y'all are in breakout rooms, Hannah and I can explore that a little bit more or if somebody knows the answer to that, go ahead and drop it in the chat. But um, it, the information stays here until I clear it. And so, but we'll continue to play around to see if you can download. I know there's, here's an export. So it looks like, yes, you can export it. What it exports it to, I'm not 100% sure. So I'll play with that while y'all are in your, your breakout groups. Cause that's a great question. I know if you're wanting to keep student information or content shared, um, that's a great point. So Hannah's gonna drop into chat the link to this Google Slides document. And what I would ask that you do is join me down here on slide 11. We're gonna go into some breakout rooms, very similar to the format that Shauna was talking about when she puts her students into breakout groups. We're gonna put about, about six of you in a group and we're gonna take, I don't know that we have 20 minutes, we'll probably do 10 minutes at this point in time for about 10 minutes. So we may drop it down to about four of you. If you'll do some, some brief introductions within your breakout group, again, like Shauna said, our timer is gonna be 60 seconds to alert you when it's time to start wrapping up. The rooms will automatically close and bring you back at the end of those 60 seconds, and then we'll come back and reconvene to debrief. So here's just the logistics, but like I said, I think we're gonna take this down to about four, and because of time, we'll do about 10 minutes. And to do that, if you've never created breakout rooms, what I added in here is, this, is the screenshots that will walk you through how to set up breakout rooms. So if you're the host, you'll see the breakout room option. If you're not the host, you won't see the button to create the breakout rooms. The first one that's gonna pop up, I can tell it how many rooms I want, whether they're automatic or manually populated. Then I'm gonna hit create rooms. The list of my students is going to pop up or those for each room are going to pop up. Then I'm going to hit this options button down here at the bottom. And this is where Shauna was talking about. You can change the time of the breakout rooms. You can change the seconds and the countdown timer. It'll notify you if you would like, but it lets you um, put your own personal spin on what you want those breakout rooms to be. So when you're in those breakout rooms, here's what I would ask that you do. 
if you would go through and quickly assign roles, really just to help keep the process going forward, we'd ask that there be a facilitator who's kind of the let's keep moving forward. If you would find someone who will act as your scribe, then a reporter, and then everyone will act as a participant. And so the scribe is going to actually be the one, well, your group can decide how you do this once you hear what you're gonna be asked to do. So your prompt is exactly what we asked Margaret and Shauna to do. Within your groups, we're gonna ask if you have an engagement strategy you have found to be effective, please share it with the group and then get into the weeds a little bit about how that strategy works. And then what we'd ask that you do is I have a different Padlet that we've already started populating ideas on. So not the play Padlet anymore, but the reason I gave you the slide deck and I'll quit sharing here in a minute is so there's a new Padlet link that we have already started populating ideas on. And again, I put the instructions first and set it to stay here. And then we've added Margaret's idea and we've added Shauna's idea. And then we actually linked to those ideas on the Keep Teaching website. And so what we would ask that you all do in your groups and why I said you can decide on how your groups want to scribe is as an idea is shared, will you capture it on the Padlet for us so that we can be sharing these ideas out larger across the Padlet. So if you would capture strategy shared, one idea per Padlet post, please. And if the person is comfortable, if you would go ahead and add their name to it in case people have questions, but if you don't want your name on it, that's okay too. But one of the things I wanted to point out is this now becomes the deliverable. I can hold students accountable now because I'm asking them to post something. And so not only am I putting them in groups and saying go, they have a deliverable they have to report back to me. So as their instructor, I know that they have to be doing something, they know they have to be doing something, and then I can capture that as some kind of low stakes, formative assessment to see how it's going. And that really helps keep them on task. So whether you use a Google form or a Google Doc or Padlet, it's just another way to capture a deliverable for some student accountability. So with that, just to recap, we're gonna put you in breakout groups of about four, and then I would ask that while you're in there, your prompt is to please share a strategy you have found to be effective and then capture that somehow on the Padlet. If you wanna have a scribe per group or if each person wants to post their own idea as you're sharing, and then if you still have time, choose one of those strategies and begin brainstorming how others in the group could use that in their classroom just to help people with that implementation piece. So with that, I'm going to quit sharing and I'll get your breakout rooms created. Put them to 10 minutes with a one minute wrap up time. So before we go, are there any questions we can answer? If there are, drop them into chat and we'll be sure to get those answered for you. We'll see you in a few minutes. All right, we just have a few more minutes left, but I wanted to, to share one more Zoom feature that some of you may not know about. Zoom has an annotate feature. So what I'm gonna do, I've shared my screen here, and I'm asking a, just a real quick, simple question. I have learned at least one new idea. And I'm gonna ask that you use your Zoom annotate to respond. If you've never used your Zoom annotate before, if you look up at the top of your Zoom window, there's a, Hannah, help me explain. Is there a pull down menu? Cause it's different on the host screen than the participant screen. So if you go to the, if you put your cursor up towards the top, you'll see the view options drop down, and you click on that and then you hit the annotate button and then it will let you stamp or draw or, um, put some kind of annotation on Sam's slide. And so just another quick, simple way that you can ask your students to interact with you. Um, and you can, you can capture this as well. I did look, you can export your Padlets and goodness, they give you several options. You can export it as a PDF. 
You can export it as a CSV, as an Excel file, as a picture. So yes, you can capture your Padlets as well as you can capture your annotations. Another question you could ask your students after you present a new idea. So I would, I would clear my annotates, but then just potentially asking another question. Now I've got myself an annotation mode, but anyway, another question you could possibly ask is how is everyone feeling? And you can use the sad face, the happy face, different kinds of, of questions that you could put out there. Um, just a, a couple of closing, I, I apologize we ran out of time and don't have just a, a ton of debriefing, but what I wanted to show you was, oh my goodness, my annotation stays there. I'm gonna have to get that off of there. But anyway, here's the Padlet that your colleagues have started adding ideas to. Please feel free to keep adding to that. And so it's just a way for us to continue capturing ideas, sharing ideas, as we discussed amongst ourselves before the session, no one is an expert in this and we're all trying to navigate this kind of crazy upside down different teaching environment. So, and unfortunately we're not all on campus and have those natural cross in the hallways or see each other in the coffee room and being able to say, hey, what's working for you, what's not? And so really that's the heart of these sessions is just to come together, share ideas, share what's working and really like our session outcomes were, we hope you can take one idea and leave here and, and move forward with it. And so if you wouldn't mind dropping into chat kind of as an exit ticket, what is something that stuck out to you? What is something that you're taking away that you want to try and use, whether it's breakout rooms, the chat, just something that you took away from today so that we can see what's resonating with people and, and possibly help share those ideas out. And as you're doing that, I know we're about out of time, but are there any questions that we can help answer before you leave today? And, and, and essentially we are done. So thank you for coming. I know some of you need to leave to get to class, but I don't wanna close our session if some of you have some burning questions that we can help answer. There's a question in the chat about, do students have the extended Zoom feature annotation like the instructor. I'm gonna go with yes, because I'm a student and I'm able to annotate on here. Um, so I think it's just a general Zoom feature. Um, can you edit a Padlet entry once it's, it's, been, it, once it's been posted? The author of it can. And so if it is your entry, you can double click back on it. But, ah. if it, but if it is not yours, you cannot. And so we were, we want to know what y'all typed in to get this little red mad face. Marco, Jane, and Terry. Did you, is that an emoji that was profanity or you got it from somewhere? We didn't put any emoji on there. No. Because if uh -oh. you look at the Padlet posting, I don't know if it is, if it misunderstood what you typed. But I don't, it, it gave you that upset face. <laughs> what? I don't, I don't. No, we didn't, we, we didn't that. I so mean, we were we hoping are, we you were tried none. something. Yeah. I don't but, even see it on there. Like my, my view of it, it's just yeah. text. I don't see an emoji whatsoever. So it says top performers get in this mad face points added to the next quiz slash test group. Oh, no, yeah. Well, I put XXX, like X amount of points. Oh, hilarious. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it shows for me. I just see XXX. So, oh, goodness. Like, oh, my I thought goodness. it was just a mad face. That's something more inappropriate. So <laughs> we know the profanity filter works. That's awesome. Uh, oh, hilarious. I, I wow. want to come in. I want to make a comment, Sam. Yes, Marco, go ahead. Uh, look at this, something that uh, is not exactly the best way to engage the students, but when they are a little bit shy and they are not participating, generally I'm asking the students, I'm gonna make, uh, I'm gonna make a question over here right now, guys. And the question is always, when is the game of the Aggies? And everybody is answering, blah, blah. And I said, come on. It's, it's, what is more important than, than DVQ class? <laughs> and I said, don't answer. 
place do not answer that question. Uh, in some way, they engage because they start saying something. I mean, it's tough. It's tough. It this is. This semester, I'm teaching uh, synchronous, and I'm feeling really lucky. Look at this. I have six students, and one group is at are attending 40 out of 60, and the other one, 55 out of 60. So I'm the luckiest professor right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let me tell you what you're doing when you do that. So when you throw out a question like, when is the Aggie game? You're actually providing your students what we call a brain break. So oh. you're, you're breaking away from, because they've hit cognitive overload. They, you know, especially in math classes when that content is so dense, <laughs> and when you see them falling off, what you're actually doing is you're, you're switching modalities and you're oh, giving hey. their brain a break. So they get to take a, if nothing else, just a, a breath and they get recharged. And now I bet they're almost just as focused from the start as they were when you get back into the math because they've had an opportunity to stop, take a self check, think differently, use a different yeah. part of their brain, get out of the heavy math mode for a minute. Yeah. And that is, <laughs> research shows us you wanna do that about every 10 to 15 minutes while oh, you're lecturing. Okay. Because with heavy content like that, they hit overload and they literally cannot take any more in because they, they, they're at their max. And so you're actually doing what research tells you is a really great practice. <laughs> and by you know, I, I changed uh, the modality the problem is um, I'm a handicapped person, so I need to use presentations, but presentations in math are not good at all. So I changed to the modality of filling the blank. So the students are filling in the blank and they are having some time to digest the mathematics. A little bit of time, no, <laughs> more than a another... presentation. That's another great strategy because you're scaffolding what they have to take in. They don't have to take everything in. They're listening for what goes in that blank. So you're actually breaking up the content and helping them focus on what's most important and what you want them to literally get out of and <laughs> fill into their paper. So that's another great strategy because as novice learners, you know, we as a disciplinary expert, we go on and on and they have a hard time deciphering is this is this important what I really need to know or is this just really kind of extra stuff? And so okay. guided notes like that really helps them focus on what's important and not that not everything you say isn't important. Don't, don't hear me say that. But it helps <laughs> them as a novice glean what they should be taking away and being able to filter this is what's important and you're helping them do that. So that's another great, great idea. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I'm gonna switch over to Tiana. She's got her yeah. hand raised. Just to share something that speaking to like kind of taking that brain break and also the kind of coffee conversations, making space for just how are you doing? There was something that I heard in a different session that I haven't had a chance to implement it yet, where they started off with just like a slide of four pictures and different pictures. One might be, one was like this little cute, cute little kitty cat peeking out from the covers. One was like a window in a very dark room where all you could see was the window. And one was like a cloudy day and I forgot what the fourth one was. And they started off with just how is your blank? How is your day? How is your week? How is your morning? And just letting them pick a picture and then describe how that fits their description of how they're doing. And so it allowed that kind of, you know, if I am, you know, I'm feeling lost and alone, I'm in that, that, that window that's dark, or I see the light, wow. you know, kind of thing. So an opportunity to have that kind of release that we are so needing in this kind of crazy twilight zone existence we're in. I appreciate you sharing because that hitting that affective domain and remembering we're all still human in this and we're not getting that social connection that a lot of us need. And two, that sends a, a, a message to your students that you care, that you, you still see them as a human, that you're interested in how they're feeling. And I know that takes class time and I know that takes time away from getting into the content, but what we know from research is that teaching is so relational and learning is so relational 
And if you can take a few minutes for your students to feel like you care and that they matter and you're glad they're here so much so that you want to know how they're feeling and no, you can't spend the whole class time unpacking that, but taking a few minutes up front and then, and then like Margaret has offered, you know, maybe you have some of those outside of class time. Let's come together. Let's talk through some of these. I know to some of you and, and being open to doing that, I would almost say would probably boost your students' engagement because they're, yes, Margaret, please share. I was just going to say one of the things that I do, um, I try to get to the lecture hall early, not only to get myself set up, but the ulterior motive there is to listen to their murmurings. Um, and same thing in lab, right? Like I'll be fumbling with something. They think I'm setting something up. I'm actually eavesdropping. And so I try to hear what are they talking about? And um, if, if they're all focused, usually like if another course, a, a major grade came out and they all did poorly, because um, we teach by cohorts, right? So all the students in my class are also in all in the same other classes that semester. So if they're all upset about a test that just came out or a paper that just got graded and they're all just in a tizzy, there's no way they're going to listen to me. So I'll be like, okay, everybody, put, put your stuff down, right? I take the microphone off and I'm like, let's just have a minute to be human. And I say, talk to me, be a human, what's going on, right? And they just, you know, uh, sort of unpack whatever's bothering them. Of course, the rules of engagement are professionalism, right? We can give feedback and it, it can still be professional. Um, and, and then once they kind of get that off their chest, so to speak, and I'm able to give them maybe some insight about how that actually matters. And, you know, usually it's a writing course that they're mad about. So, you know, I help them and put it in context when we're documenting patient interactions or putting something into a medical record. Um, and, and then they kind of can calm down and we all take a deep breath and I'm like, okay, we were ready to go back on the record. And they're like, yes, I can. I'm like, okay, here we go. So then, you know, mic goes back on, you know, we start, but them seeing me take the mic off and saying we're off the record, I want to hear from you as a human, helps them sort of, you know, get over into that mode, get it off their chest, and then going back on the records, like, okay, now we're going to move forward, right? And it doesn't have to take a long time. Thank you for sharing that. I know Michael brings up a great point, too, is that, you know, sometimes students see us as too conversational or it's wasting class time. So I think like Margaret talked about putting it in context and putting it back in, this is why we're doing this. And I think that will hopefully help ease some of those, but there are some who are just aren't sharers. Thank you all so much for being here. Like we said.